Hello and welcome to React Native Radio. I'm your host, Nader Dabit. Today on our panel, we have Gant Laborde. Hey, hey. Spencer Carley. Hello, everyone. And our special guest today is Josh Justice of Big Nerd Ranch. Welcome to the show, Josh. Hey, thanks so much. I'm glad to be here. Well, it's good to have you. And I think we're going to be talking about a really important and popular topic today, testing. And we'll be covering everything from end-to-end testing to unit testing uh, to test-driven development, everything you could think of, hopefully. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to mash all of this up into a nice, concise uh, episode <laughs> and cover as much as we can. But before nice. we get into the topic, can you give us an overview of yourself and your background? Sure. So I've been a software developer for about 14 years. Uh, my background is in server-side development. But a few years ago, when I started at Bigger Branch as a consultancy, I started to broaden out into front-end JavaScript development, some native development, and into React Native. Um, I'd kind of come up through the Ruby world, and, and testing is really, really big there. And so as I started looking into any other platforms I want, might want to develop on, the first thing that I thought about is, like, how can I do testing or test-driven development in them? So as I did that, I started putting together a website called LearnTDD.in. Um, it was kind of just serving as a self-reference for, hey, next time I want to pick up React or Vue.js, how can I do testing in it? So I've been sort of sharing that around. And I found that as I've gotten into React Native more, that testing's kind of become a niche for me just because there isn't quite as much testing information available. So I did a live stream series on test-driven development in React Native. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm on track to do a testing workshop at Chain React this year. I'm super excited about that. Uh, and as a part of getting preparing for that, I'm putting together a kind of a reference website called reactnativetesting.io just as a one-stop shop for information on React Native testing. So that's uh, some about me. When I think of Big Nerd Ranch, I automatically think of iOS development, but you are here mm-hmm. to talk about React Native, and you got into it from Ruby. So can you tie all of these things together for us? It's kind of uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So Big Nerd Ranch uh, originally got started in Mac development and then very quickly moved into iOS once iOS became a thing. They eventually added in an Android department as well, and they merged maybe four or five years ago with a Ruby studio called High Groove. So that became the web team for Big Nerd. And in the last couple of years, as the, the desire for front-end development has gotten bigger and bigger, we've moved into React and Vue.js. And I think we have a, a, a unique opportunity for getting involved with React Native as well because we have these really top-notch native development teams for iOS and Android. Um, they can speak to some of those native uh, aspects of React Native that I'm not as experienced in. And a lot of uh, RN developers that have come from the web may not be as familiar with the Xcode, with Android Studio, and some of those lower-level things So I'm excited to see what Big Nerd might be able to do as far as contributing and teaching when it comes to those native integrations. So can you talk about the the overarching story of testing in React Native? Like what is a end-to-end test? What is a unit test? And kind of what what are the categories of tests? And then we'll go into each of those. Sure. I know uh, Gant has done a talk recently on the whole universe of all the kind of breadth of different testing related (laughs) things that are possible. Um, So uh, we should definitely get that in the show notes for uh, folks to check out. My focus has been more on sort of the kind of foundational example based testing. So the kind of traditional style you'd think of when it comes to testing an individual class or function or testing the functionality of your whole app together. So the kind of traditional testing pyramid or permutations of the testing pyramid, reshapements of it. So end-to-end testing is kind of, uh, it, it gets at the external quality, you could say, of your application in terms of when everything fits together, does it work as it's intended? So end-to-end testing is really from the standpoint of the user. So you're simulating what the user sees on the screen and what the user is touching or interacting with. And you might connect to a real backend service or you might fake that out. But either way, from the standpoint of your React Native application, it's touching all the pieces and hooking them together. When it comes to unit testing, all of these terms are used in various ways. So uh, I'm just kind of describing the amorphous blob or cloud that I think of when it comes to unit tests. Um, But unit tests tend to refer to individual pieces of your application. So in a React or React Native app, an individual component, uh, or maybe it's child components, might be a unit. Um, A reducer or uh, an action within a Redux store might be a unit as well. And for those, those tend to focus more on the internal quality of the application. So are all the edge cases handled? Um, Is the interface, like the inputs and the outputs to that component, is it easily usable within your application? So those unit tests can tend to contribute more to 
uh, the internal code quality that's going to set you up for um, your app not slowing down and getting harder and harder to maintain over time. And they really complement one another. Um, so I, I highly recommend uh, using both. So the two main types of testing are basically unit testing and end-to-end testing. What are people using right now in React Native in the ecosystem for doing these types of tests? Sure. Well, whether you're using end-to-end testing or unit testing, um, you need a test runner. Um, Maybe that's not the most formal term for it, but that's what a lot of folks call it. And the two most common ones in the React world are Mocha and Jest. Uh, Jest is probably more popular. It's coming out of Facebook. It I really like it for the all-in-one approach that it has. I mean, you add Jest to your project, and you've kind of got all the tools you need for kind of basic testing. Um, so, And you can run different end-to-end or unit testing tools through either of those. So when it comes to end-to-end testing, Detox is really the library of choice. It's by Wix Engineering, and it's really, really great. Um, I've had some limited experience with end-to-end testing with native iOS, and it's really challenging. Um, if any folks have done uh, testing on the web, you know, the DOM is a standard that's, you know, uh, works across different browsers. And so it's easy for testing tools to hook into that uh, to be able to do those end-to-end tests. When it comes to native development, you know, there's not a standard like the DOM for UI widgets. And so it's harder. And so what Wix has been able to do with Detox um, to create really easy to read, easy to write, and reliable end-to-end tests is really neat. So Detox is definitely the choice to go with when it comes to end-to-end. And that could run on top of Mocha or Jest, and there's not a lot of difference in that case. When it comes to uh, unit tests, uh, unit tests can refer to just testing plain old classes or functions. Um, And in that case, you would just use Jest or Mocha directly. When it comes to testing your components, um, there's a few different libraries. So Enzyme is a library from component testing, and that allows you to write some JSX and mount up a component uh, or a component tree and interact with it. And uh, Enzyme originated on the web, but it, it was adapted to work on React Native as well. Um, but it is maintained by Airbnb. And since Airbnb is famously moving away from React Native now, that gives me a little bit of nervousness as far as like just how maintained that's going to be in the future. So I'm really excited about a library called React Native Testing Library by Callstack. Um, so this is modeled after a React testing library that Ken C. Dodds has created, and it's gaining a ton of interest because it's really great. Um, it has a bit of an opinionated take as far as what is or isn't useful when it comes to testing components. Um, and it's it, React Native testing library is a bit more of an all-in-one solution. Um, it works best with Jest. Um, I haven't been able to get it working with Mocha yet. Um, so if you're using Jest, um, I would definitely reach for React Native testing library. So those are some of the tools that I would reach for. So, Gant, what do you all use at Infinite Red, and uh, is that some of the same stuff that you talk about in your talks? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, great points all around on that stuff, by the way. Um, and, and also, I have to agree with that sort of that pain that you end up with enzyme, where you're just like, uh, they're like, hey, you can test the flange on the this. And you're like, well, should I? Right? Like, I think an opinion is really important there. and And sort of like remembering that, a component sort of isn't just a shadow dom with a with like you know all these different bells and whistles there's a certain contract that a component is supposed to fulfill and um i definitely i talked to josh about this and i've been doing a lot of research on uh react native testing library and and i agree completely we need to sort of agree um inside of react what 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 is a good thing to test with the component when should i break those build a story around that because usually we just throw people in there and we say look you can test whatever you want inside there Uh, and that's not very helpful to most people so i love that and i love sort of the story that you're building around that josh um also detox a big fan of detox Uh, i think that it's so much better than than all the other options out there and i'd love to see detox and testing farm um like blog posts like a, a sort of like a unified solution that brings everything together and seeing you kind of like tread forward on that front and bring tests like this to react native itself. Those are, those are sort of like the confirming points that starts to like really get the ball rolling for everybody here. Cause it's, it's a little bit of the wild west to me. Yeah. When you mentioned uh, bringing tests to react native itself, that's a good thing to mention in case we want to dive into that. So um, the React Native uh, core team reached out to me because they have an app inside React Native called RN Tester. It originated as a um, sort of a 
kind of like a, a, a storybook. Like, hey, you load up this app and you can see examples of all the different components and APIs of React Native and just try them out. You can manually test them. But over time, they've started to get more interested in using Detox to automate the testing of what they can automate within uh, our end tester. And so um, I've been kind of working with them gradually as I have time to get the RN tester app and the test suite around it in a kind of a standardized shape, uh, like you were saying, yeah, to make things consistent. Because what they really want to do, um, you may have seen a theme with the React Native team over the last couple months and year of wanting to encourage more community involvement. And so the, the team has a real desire to enable the community to contribute tests. Um, and, you know, there's so many facilities offered by React Native, it makes sense that different people would run across different edge cases. And so if folks can contribute tests to cover those, um, that's going to really help. One reason this is really strategic yeah. is because of some of the rewrites that are happening internally, like Fabric, um, changing out the internals of React Native. And so the React Native team is going to be relying heavily on these detox tests to ensure that things still work. And so this is something that, that uh, you know, Facebook and us in the community can kind of get together on to really flesh out that test suite to make sure that all those improvements we're going to get with the updates to React Native won't come at the cost of, uh, you know, things, you know, losing features or things flaking out in the meantime. Exactly. And well, here's one of the things. Uh, the RN tester sort of tests that vanilla uh, app sort of feel. And we've we've really matured. Flatlist originally, and then when you look at it, it's just sort of like a simple thing, but people are using the optimizations and the benefits of Flatlist to do all kinds of wild and crazy style stuff. And I think that uh, using manual testing to check those, like those aren't going to happen anymore because people aren't going to be able to look and, and immediately um, understand all those different UIs. But bringing in automated testing that sort of helps tell that story and also shows the example case of what it's expecting to have happen. That's the ability now that when those get in there, we can actually kind of push and get those corner cases and actually get tests for them. And I think that this is the thing. Facebook always gets to test and make sure that the things that go into Facebook will always work. This gives the opportunity to make sure the things that are happening in some crazy app of some company that's starting to put a lot of money behind it, well, those features always go uh, forward. So, all like uh, as you bring this in there, this is this has been something that's been important. This is a growth point to the to React Native and its adoption. That actually kind of makes me think of a question I wanted to have for y'all as far as your usage of React Native. So when it comes to RN Tester and, and when it comes to Detox, the kind of things that are the easiest to automate testing are behavioral things. Like as a user, I tap on this, I type this, and then I see this text or this element on the screen. Now, things that are harder, um, and I think some folks are looking into ways to test those, but, you know, are the, are the visuals showing up just the way we want? Am I getting 60 frames per second? Is there any jank when it comes to dragging to scroll and things like that? Those are things that I would imagine. And the, the advice in the industry that I've generally gotten is, hey, you're still going to want to manually test those anyways. And that's OK. Like, that's not a problem, at least until someone comes and, you know, creates new revolutionary testing technologies. So I think that aspect of you know, RN tester will continue to be useful for that while we also automate the things that can be automated. So I'm, I'm curious for you all when it comes to testing that you've done, uh, automated or manual, um, does, do the bugs, the issues, the things you need to work on come up tend to be behavioral or do they tend to be those edge cases and flicker and things like that? But by the way, I just I, after speaking with Facebook, you wouldn't believe the amazing testing that they have inside. So you're talking about um, tests to make sure that there is no kind of like major regression in performance. So you're talking about performance tests. You're talking about um, mistakes that could happen uh, about possible device problematic tests. There's so many wild and crazy things. Facebook's covered that for themselves. If you ever actually talk to them about what they do internally, it is impressive. The amount, I mean, they, they check the device temperatures to make sure that that's not what's causing the difference. It's really cool. But for us, there's no anomaly detection library, right? So, and they can't make that. So I think that would be really great is, um, JavaScript and the community in general, like generally doesn't need to check for those things in web as much as devices. So there's a lot of green field for people who are looking to step up like you, Josh, and people who are looking to build like a crazy new library like Kent C. Dodds did for, for this entire setup. 
there, if you're the first one to create an excellent anomaly detection JavaScript library, or if you're the person who's going to like breaking them into their own fields and then having a nice way for people to glue those back together, the the sort of JavaScript on the Internet of Things, um, that's a that's a spot where I don't think that uh, anything but major companies have done. And we see a little bit like image regression testing, like taking snapshots of stuff and making sure screens didn't break or that they've only changed within a certain percentage. Um, those are really cool. Usually they're like specific to a project and kind of flaky and, and not very clear for the rest of us. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited as uh, if if like the community could start building some of the foundation base, like some of these major companies have internally that they can't really outsource to us. But I, I won't take that for everybody. I don't know if everybody else kind of runs into the same kind of problems where um, you ship one thing and then screen 17 takes twice as long to load. I don't know if you've ever kind of come up with that. Uh, maybe Spencer or Natter. Does that ever happen to you? The only testing, honestly, that I've ever done in React Native has been unit testing with, with Jest. And it's actually been over a year since I've even done that back when I was doing consulting. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't really have a lot of, of experience in testing, honestly. Yeah, I mean, for me in general, like, so prior to working with React Native, I worked with Meteor.js. And if you worked with Meteor.js before, you know, you don't, there, there was no testing solutions there. There were people who tried to do it. And so I'm super guilty of, I'll write a test once I break something. Um, and I <laughs> ship that to production. So, but yeah, it, it's for me, testing has always been manual. Like, oh, you know, we've got this problematic screen. That screen 17 in this instance, like there's certain cases where something can go wrong. Like that's just part of our QA process. Um, and yeah, personally, like I've never found a great solution. I can't say I've looked into it much because to me, testing is just kind of uh, confusing or it's hard for me to try to figure out like, okay, this is the interaction I take as a user on this touch device. How do I codify that into an automated test to uh, actually do so? Yeah, that, that's kind of been my testing journey. Of It's just been too hard for me to figure out. It's typically just been me working solo on a lot of these projects. So I just kind of put it on the back burner and never and go back to it. That's like an interesting like lead into another discussion. Like when yeah. is a good time to write tests or should you write tests at all for certain you know types of projects? Like I worked with a lot of fast moving startups that were prototyping and building out things. And their end goal was to get something shipped out the door to see if, if they could onboard users. And a lot of times yeah, testing uh, was like the last thing on the plate. I think uh, what I've seen in a lot of companies is once you have something that's that's stable or you or, or you have something that you know is going to be there, that's when you start writing tests. But I could be wrong or that could be not the right solution, but that seems to be kind of what I've seen. But also... Um, also see a little bit of discussion around uh, with with TypeScript and Flow becoming so much more popular these days, especially TypeScript. That people are saying that maybe that tests or unit tests uh, are not as important as they used to be. Like, what do you all think about that? I'll just kind of throw in. There. I I want to say thanks because like it's there's such an imposter syndrome around tests that like this is really nice to actually have like an honest conversation. I feel like people listening can feel a little bit better about this. I also like there's a lot of people who get real angry about the idea, like you just said, um, about backfilling tests and not doing TDD. Josh, do you have like a specific opinions about that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. For me, it's easy to get into testing coming from the background I have where I've gotten in like a lot of the theory in a context. I always say that in Rails, the testing paths are well trod. So like that was one of the reasons I moved into the Ruby world was to see testing when it had already been very well proven out. I mean, it's exactly the opposite of the Wild West that you all described that we had yeah. in React and React Native. So for me, like, you know, having that knowledge, like it's easy for me to try to reach for them. But even on the, the latest React Native side project I worked on, it was also kind of startup-y. I, I have no business skills, so I doubt I'll ever start a business with anything on the side. But this app, like, even to know whether or not I would find it useful, I was like, I don't know if I'll find it useful. So I was not motivated to write any tests. I just wanted to put something together in Expo and then start trying it out to see if I liked it. Then once I got to the point that I liked it and I started getting kind of dependency updates, I was like, you know, I think I'd like to have some detox tests around here so that I can rerun them and make sure that a dependency that I pulled down doesn't break anything. I've got a friend that works at a two-person two startup as well. 
And he says that in retrospect, he wishes that he only had end-to-end tests and not any lower level tests because all of the internals were moving around a lot. But that was a, a, an app that was proven out enough that they knew that the app was going to continue to be there, but all of the internals could change a lot of the time. So that was the, the constraints that he found. I think some of my goal on putting this test material out there and this is great that this has come up because I want to think about the way I come across talking about testing to make sure it doesn't feel like a pressure thing. Um, I am newer to front end and to React Native than any of y'all and probably a lot of the listeners and just folks in the community. So none of this is saying, hey, I know for sure you need to be doing this. This is, hey, if you want to test or if you want to do TDD, here's how you can do it. And now try it out in your in your circumstances and see what you find useful and what you don't find useful. One of the questions that I'm really interested in, in thinking about and hearing about is, does the component model that React has popularized mean that unit tests are, are less useful? One of the things that has been needed for those in the past is thinking about the interface of, the com- of, of a function or of a class, like what is passed in and what, is, what comes back out. I want to design that interface. But maybe there's something about the component model that that's kind of a solved problem and it's sort of obvious. And so maybe unit tests are less useful in React apps than they are in uh, other ecosystems, other platforms. So I'm excited to get input from others that to share their thoughts on um, which of these types of tests are useful when. Um, I'm definitely open to that as well. When it comes to types, uh, that's a really interesting topic. Um, I think it, it as I've, I've thought a lot about that, as static types approaches have kind of become more and more popular. Also working in native iOS development for about six months, uh, working in Swift, uh, static that's all about static types and the iOS community is very excited about those. So I got to learn from excited people the reasons that they were excited about those. Um, I haven't tended to reach for static type systems too much yet. And the reason is, I think because of this goes back to the same thing I was just mentioning, the different uh, environments that we work in. So on my on our consulting projects and on my personal projects, we tend to be in a small team environment and we tend to work in a way that we expect a lot of change. So we're doing the agile type development where I want to build out the minimum I need right now to, to solve the current feature that I have. And then I'm going to plan to shift the code around once the next feature comes in to adjust it for that. So because of that, um, flexibility is key. Like we, if you're going to be re- refactoring your code and rearranging things on every single story, you want to make sure things are as flexible as possible. And J- JavaScript has, you know, using JavaScript without types has worked great for me in that so far. Now, I know some of the cases where I've heard a lot of value from TypeScript um, are larger teams where you have a lot of people working. And so you want to make sure that changes propagate throughout the code base and that they match up. But that's a circumstance where you're much more likely to have type mismatches and, you know, uh, functions that are not found on an object and things like that. So I could certainly see the value of static types there. Uh, the other thing is, it seems like just about every framework author is working in TypeScript or ReasonML or something like that. And I have not worked in a framework. And so the amount of just complexity that's going on there, I certainly understand that the safety that static types provide would be helpful. When it comes to the the, the value that um, the tests add uh, in addition to types, it's really, in a sense, it's kind of a both and thing. If, you, if you're using static types, I think there's still a reason to consider having tests as well. And that's because types make sure that um, all the pieces connect together correctly, that you're passing the right types and you're not going to get those, you know, undefined errors or missing method errors or things like that. Um, but types aren't going to tell you that a calculation was done correctly or that um, the, the, the right elements are showing on the screen at the right times. So I think if you're going to the, the question, you know, we just talked about the question of whether you want tests or not. And I think that that question will still be there even when you have static types. So the question of like, do I need to confirm that user flows are still going to work when I make changes? Um, and do I need to confirm that certain edge cases are going to happen and be handled properly in this component? And so I would still think about um, the question about whether what kind of testing you want, whether you want ty- uh, testing, whether you have static types or not. There's a few resources I can put in the chat, and hopefully we can get in the show notes on this topic. Um, so Uncle Bob Martin had uh, created a very controversial, like he tends to do, uh, post uh, assessing Swift and what he thought about it. And then he had a follow-up post about types and tests and how they interact. And so there's a lot of valuable thoughts there. Also, Gary Bernhardt uh, did a talk called Ideology or Ideology, I think as an American, I tend to more pronounce it, where he talked about types and tests and how they relate to how people think about their software and the kind of correctness that you're looking for. So I think both of those are really interesting resources to, to check out to think about types and tests. And both of them really have a theme that is a both and thing, that both of them have value in different and overlapping ways. That was sort of a speech there. Sorry about that. Yeah, I no, want to hear I, y'all's I, thoughts I, as well. Of, uh, I love I mean, it. 
the, the th it's interesting because it depends on the uh, the work environment, the project, the you know the company. Everything really is all kind of dependent on how the strategy is, even the team of developers and the person in charge of the team. But what I have noticed uh, in a few of the projects I've worked with that we would have um, situations where we would have crashes that we couldn't really recognize. So the the main priority would be into end testing uh, first because of uh, because of that. Um, and then, and then the the next thing we would do would be the unit testing. Is that typically what you see, or was that is that just uh, is that normal? I want to let the other folks take a stab at that first before I jump. Or back like in. you know, get, like what uh, what do you all typically do at Infinite Red uh, when you're implementing uh, testing in, in some of your client work? So, so to 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 start off, I, I think that. Um, Implementing um, types, strong types uh, from the beginning. For, for TypeScript, it's just stupid simple. So the first thing we kind of do is we, 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 we just kind of made that a premise. And even though we do have multiple people working, like Josh said, um, there's also the curse of like libraries, which is you have to go back and edit your own self in six months, and you're going to break your own thing. So types kind of protect you from yourself in a few ways. Uh, but here's the thing. You change your files to .ts and you turn off like implicit nulls and you're already a better JavaScript developer and you don't have to implement a single type. So I kind of like that uh, that mentality. Just just turn it on. It's a super script. Of, it's like a super uh, set of, of JavaScript. So why not just kind of have it there? And then if you have a moment where you have to enforce some made up object that you have, then you can kind of put in a little bit of TypeScript. So it can kind of like slowly be a gateway drug. That's the smartest thing that they ever did with TypeScript by far, is that you can find yourself saying, oh, I can stop this bug from happening right now and change it. So the second you type it, and that's the thing, the value of it is the second you make the mistake, you get a red underline. That is way better than shipping and finding out from QA that something broke and then having it come back. The, the feedback loop is so small and so cheap. Um, we turn that on by default. And then uh, uh, the second thing is for us, for, for consultancy, is that we have to sell testing. <laughs> so that might be something that's valuable. One of the best things I want to say is like the most expensive app that you could possibly make is the one that doesn't work or doesn't do what you want it to do. Um, and so in that sense, it's not a bad idea to go ahead and actually have them put a little bit of money up front on tests and kind of protect it. I understand a lot of people need to ship and get things out the door as soon as possible. But if there's money involved, um, imagine this as like car insurance, right? It's a, it's a way to protect your investment and make sure that you're not going to end up on your ass and, and, and terrible. So the, the ability here is that a little bit of money a little extra going towards fewer features, but more durable features. That's how we kind of sell it, uh, and it and it it's not it's not uh, it's not anything but uh, the truth, kind of wrapped into a beautiful line, right? And so we get to say that, but we really do enjoy the the projects that we work on where we get to add tests, and and some people who who really want the advanced stuff. We do get into being able to like deploy detox and some more advanced testing and some really cool stuff. It seems that the younger a project is, the fewer tests it needs, and also the the less likely that people are to invest in it. When something's starting to hit version 2.0 or 3.0, the conversation around testing starts to get real hot, and we really like those. So um, if you've got money coming in, you can't have that product break. Right. So it's no longer like a startup idea. It's 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 version two and three point oh. That's when like all of a sudden performance test anomaly detection, sort of like the pains that we're yelling at Facebook about. And everybody's like plus wanting and yelling at each other on GitHub. When you start to experience that for yourself, you start to go, oh, yeah, this this is hard to do and move fast and break stuff at the same time. So I, I, what we generally do is we want to put as much testing in as, as our clients will allow because it means that our product's going to be much more reliable and better. But we understand budget. And honestly, it's always a trade-off of budget. Yeah, the point about the different circumstance you're in once you reach version 2.0 makes a lot of sense. I'm definitely a fan of 
responding to what happens on a project and just thinking about the fact that every project and team and technology is different. So you can um, look at what you're doing and say like, oh, I see here that I'm getting a lot of type errors. I think TypeScript would be really useful if you're someone like me and that hasn't yet gone to them by default. If you find that users are reporting a lot of errors, wow, I think we need to step up our end-to-end -end tests. Or if you find that you're having to do a bunch of maintenance on tests and they're not really catching much, maybe you scale back on them. Um, yeah. And I think one of the things, and maybe this can come into the way I talk about testing as well, it's, you know, if you know, if you've learned the, the tools of testing and sort of the approach and thought process of testing, then it's ready for you and you can see when you could apply it versus uh, you might not see the need for testing if you haven't tried it yet. Or if you do, it might be the point where, okay, we have a, a emergency need for testing. Time to me to learn it from first principles may not be the right time to do it. And so I think that's one of the things to look at. Like, let me, let me try, even if I don't know how often I'll reach for it, let me learn testing approaches and testing tools so they're in my tool belt when I need them. And I'm realizing that that totally applies to me to, for TypeScript as well. Like, I need to learn that so that it's available in my tool belt and I could sense when it would add value. Yeah, that, that's a, and I love that you, it's a conversation. And that's what testing really should be. And I feel like that that's the best part is, you know, uh, there are far too many places that have an idealism around it. Right. Uh, I don't know if you've ever worked with like the, the person who's like, you're not doing this right. <laughs> or if you've worked with people who are like, we will not write tests like that will never add value. The answer is always somewhere in the gray. Yeah, one of the things I love about Big Nerd Ranch and for what it sounds like and from interacting with y'all at Infinite Red is that that's not the culture. Like, that's not the kind of <laughs> conversations you run across. Um, and so it's nice to be in a positive environment where we can really respect each other and listen and take the time. Like, it takes time for me to talk to somebody at Big Nerd that doesn't like test very much and hasn't seen a lot of value. That was one of the things that I think prepared me the most for getting into React Native testing was being on the iOS team. Our iOS team and iOS community in general doesn't do as much testing. Um, and so I was able to come in as a Ruby developer saying like, wow, why? And uh, luckily we have a world-class <laughs> iOS team. And so I was not, it, it would have been completely arrogant for me to come in thinking that I was the person with all the testing answers. Uh, I probably would have been tempted to do that otherwise. But so I came in with questions and heard so many things that they shared about the iOS context um, the constraints of Apple's APIs and of the Swift language, uh, the differences about, you know, the kind of consulting projects we do. And I understood why they make the decisions they do when it came to testing. And so it helped me come to React Native with more of an open mind to think about those constraints. That's really awesome. And then thanks for documenting your path and live blog. Uh, do you do you like a live stream? Uh, I can't. What is the action like? Do a live Twitch uh, things all the time or like how often does that happen because I've seen and watched a few in retrospect but I, I would love for more of that yeah I have been in a pattern of live streaming weekly and so it's on Fridays at 2 p.m eastern oh, um, I've oh, taken nice. a bit of a break we mentioned this before the uh, recording started but we've actually adopted a baby in the last month so that's very Ooh. exciting um, it's been really cool <laughs> so um, but we've so I've been off of the live streaming schedule for a couple of months but that's starting up again in just a couple of weeks and I try to do it weekly um, I have a few uh, series uh, that I'll go through sometimes just a random one-off topic will come up like I remember when uh, that one JavaScript dependency had a security issue and I was freaking out about like is it even responsible for me to write JavaScript apps and so I was like what if I had no dependencies like what if I just use preact and I just used some other libraries by them and I just pulled them in with script tags. And so like, I just kind of went like, wow. I'm not saying I'm going to stop using dependencies, but what if I got to that point? So some random experiments I might do from week to week on there. But yeah, uh, the weekly schedule has been a lot of fun. Um, I hadn't followed a lot of uh, live streams coding, but I found it's a really nice low pressure way from well, low pressure for me. I'm familiar with public speaking. I'm sure it would be high pressure for a lot of folks. But for me, I don't have to prepare a blog post in advance. I can just kind of jump on the stream and share what I'm working on that week and uh, get input from folks on the chat. And uh, also going to create some resources that are recorded for folks to check back on later, um, in particular that uh, TDD series um, working on React Native. So that's fun to be able to share that. And that's that's exactly what's going to be a kind of. But starting up in, again in a couple weeks, I'm going to start that weekly live stream again. Um, for me, it's it's a really low pressure environment. I know for a lot of folks, it might be high pressure, um, but I've done some public speaking. Um, but it's the fact that I can just kind of go into the live stream with whatever I'm working on at the time. 
So a few different times I've done a series, like a, the React Native TDD series, and that was a lot of fun and served as kind of like a test case for the material that we're going to be doing at the workshop at Chain React this year. But other weeks that I've had just kind of something random that I've been looking into that I've shared about, like uh, when we had that uh, security issue with that one JavaScript dependency a few months back, I started freaking out and I was like, is it even responsible for me to write JavaScript applications with all these dependencies? And I, I'm still doing that. But I just decided if I ever decided maybe I don't want to do that, like what would the alternative be? And so one week I just jumped in with uh, Preact.js and I pulled it in with just a script tag right in the HTML document. And I had a no build process. And I was like, how can I make an application? Like, can this even work? And I found that it did. So uh, live streams have been a fun chance to kind of do experiments like that as well. Um, as well as just having some time in my schedule to kind of have these series that kind of build up. I just found and put in the chat, um, there's a blog post uh, by Noop Cat, which my brain always reads as Noop Cat whenever I see her handle, but I think Noop is, is what's going on there. Um, she has an amazing post on how she got into live coding and the basics of the setup, and it was great. Uh, I read that, and I was set to go for live coding. So if any of y'all or any of the listeners are interested in live coding, um, check out that blog post in the show notes, and it's a great way to get started. Um, and feel free to uh, ping me on Twitter or jump into my live stream and ask questions there as well, because um, it's been a lot of fun, and uh, I've gotten a lot of excitement out of it. So I have a couple of questions. Um, so we've gone over most of the testing stuff. We might touch on uh, a little bit more before we wrap it up. But I know that uh, Big Nerd Ranch does a lot of uh, um, training. And, and do you do, all do consulting as well? Yeah, we do uh, consulting, working on projects. Um, we do training workshops called the Big Nerd Ranch Boot Camps. Um, and we also write books. Um, now, I have not done those workshops or written books, but we have folks that do. Um, and so the books are on uh, Android and iOS, as well as on Swift and the Kotlin language. And we have a front end development book as well that kind of takes folks from, hey, I don't know anything about how the web works, all the way up to building apps with WebSockets and things like that. Um, so those books are available, and uh, those are great, highly recommended. Um, it's a great way. It would be great for React Native developers if you want to learn more about iOS or Android development. Um, then either those uh, books or a one-week boot camp would be uh, great. So we'd love to have uh, folks jump in. So are you seeing an increased um, number of people asking for React Native stuff, or do you all do that, get into that there? Yeah, we are looking to uh, get going on React Native consulting work. Um, and we've included it in our sales process. Um, one of the things for us that's interesting is because we haven't, like, we certainly haven't gone to say we're doing React Native exclusively. So it's a both and thing. We'll build, you know, traditional native apps as well as React Native apps. And so that kind of makes things a bit complex for the sales folks, as you might imagine. Um, I'm interested to hear from Gantt in a second what, how, uh, if uh, Infinite Red evolved uh, towards having a React Native focus. Um, but for us, like, we were really thinking about the, um, the trade-offs and uh, being able to say, like, you know, what can we say to clients about the uh, development velocity um, that we're going to be able to give them, um, the stability. Um, it's led us to kind of think a lot about what are the different types of apps you might want to have and which ones would be a great fit for React Native or even just using Expo directly uh, versus going to a native level. So as we get more experience in React Native consulting, that'll make it easier for us to speak to that. But uh, yeah, it's, it's been a challenge to kind of figure things out as far as like what and there's a difference with, with clients when it comes to like the short term and long term costs, because when it comes to kind of, you know, picking a consulting project or a consultancy amongst a, a set of consultancies, there's a big question of like, how much is this going to cost and how much am I going to get out of it? And it may sometimes it may be that a React Native app is going to be much cheap, cheaper in the short term and continue to be so. Or sometimes it might be that it's like, well, hey, like with the scope that you have, it's going to be about the same cost to build a React Native app or a native app. But, you know, because you're planning on maintaining the two platforms going forward, because 95% of the time you're using platform standard stuff, you know, hey, you're going to see those cost savings indefinitely. Also, from having a web team already, you're going to see cost savings there from the flexibility of developers being able to do build web and uh, native features at the same time. But that might not necessarily show up in the bill for the initial, initial consulting project. So, Gant, I'm curious to hear from you what <laughs> Infinite Red has uh, moved into React Native and um, how the, the costs have worked out for clients in that regard. Well, just just as a heads up, and I'm sure everybody here feels this pain. Um, uh, so I came from Ruby as well, by the way, which that's not the pain part. Uh, Ruby is centered around developer happiness. And uh, they actually have sort of like this mantra of if you keep your developers happy, you actually, the company and the product are happy and it's maintainable and you can kind of work with it. I think that's why they focus so hard on tests in Ruby. 
And what happened is uh, when we started building mobile apps, one of the things we did is we brought that Ruby centric mentality to it. And the most painful thing in the world was watching, you know, WWDC and then watching uh, Android releases and, and having to keep up with two different platforms. That was basically the antithesis of developer happiness. <laughs> um, and so we we always were eager to take on solutions. We actually were like pros at Ruby Motion. I don't know if you remember Ruby Motion around back in the day, but uh, if you ever used Ruby Motion, you used our libraries because we created unified APIs between two different platforms by sharing that sort of stress uh, amongst each other. And and when React Native was released, it was sort of a breath of fresh air. It's like this is that same kind of mentality, but it's not its not the phone gap feel, right? It's not that disgusting, put a web view in there kind of thing, uh, which by the way, stop doing that, everybody. Stop, <laughs> stop it. I know you wanna do it and it's cheaper, please stop it. But we were able to, to sh shave off a lot of price and focus on a lot of developer happiness and quality. And uh, since that solution has been there, it's been well embraced by us. And it's been well embraced by our clients uh, who who now you can't say, I'll get an iOS app. And if I have the money, I'll get an Android app. That was so 2010, right? We're, we're no longer even close to a world like that anymore. You have to say, I would like my iOS, my Android, and then I'd like maybe mm, like an Xbox app. And can you get it to work with Fire TV? And, and sort of like where we are now is that your surface area is very important to the success of your product. And uh, the finances of something like that would be exponential without a, an excellent solution like React Native. So we found that it fits our clients and it fits us. But uh, I'm sure like, I mean, sure, Spencer, you've had to sell quite a few things um, is that sort of the same story that you have to go through when, when you're talking to people to sell it? Yeah. So when I'm selling things like it's typically, it's just me working on the project. So I'm solo okay. consultant, typically working with, you know, someone bootstrapping it. I've got a few clients who are funded, but it's typically people bootstrapping, uh, their project. And the big thing here is like, what's the, like, like you said, surface area is a big thing. Uh, people want iOS and Android. A lot of people want web or require web for maybe it's just admin functionality. And how can we basically utilize as much of the same things between these different platforms? And React Native is a great means for it. Um, we've said earlier, like, it's fantastic having a web team that can also, maybe they're not 100% driving the mobile interaction, but they can at least contribute to it. This one little functionality, like that's been hugely, hugely valuable and a great selling point um, for React Native. And likewise, like you said, going with PhoneGap, like it's just, sure. it's night and day between these two solutions. And yeah, that's just the big thing. just how can we get the most bang for our buck given a relatively tight budget uh, for the different clients? So, I just shared a few um, No, no, go ahead. I just shared a few links in the chat. Um, uh, one is a Gantt blog post. We uh, we connect on all the media. We blog to each other, <laughs> chat, That's true. You know, tweet. Um, Coffee. So, yes, exactly. So, uh, get, so th this uh, React Native FAQ, did you write that, Gantt, or was it somebody else at Infinite Red? Oh, uh, no, no, I wrote that. Cool. Um, yeah, so that was a great uh, article about just kind of React Native at a high level. Um, I think it was kind of business focused for folks to think about the technology and whether to adopt it. And I use that sort of as an inspiration as I was working on a post about uh, called Four Approaches to React Native, thinking about the trade-offs between using Expo, using React Native CLI, and then some of the more adding it into existing apps approaches that are out there. So that's two blog posts that folks that could, could consult to think about the kind of trade-offs when it comes to using React Native and how to fit it into their their uh, company. I think either of those would be useful to folks. So for someone looking to get started learning testing in React Native, say they've been writing React Native code for a while, but they've never really done any tests, what should they start with and where can they go to learn it? That's a great question. Um, my focus so far has been on the, the like that learntdd.in website has been focused on test-driven development, but that may not be the best place to get started when you haven't used the tools at all. Um, so that's some of the focus of React Native testing.io. Like I want that to be a one-stop shop 
for folks to see uh, what tools they could use and how to learn more. Those learn more links are prominent. So folks could check out reactnativetesting.io as a starting point. Um, and they'll link on there directly to those other tools, to Enzyme, React Native Testing Library, Detox. And of course, going through the documentation for those tools can be really helpful as well. Um, that's a place that I would start. And you're giving a workshop at Chain React as well on testing? That's right. Yeah, I think, um, Gant, yeah, do you know if a registration for the workshops is open yet? You know, open up uh, probably by the time this is out. So definitely check uh, chainreactconf.com and uh, look for that. You can buy your tickets now, but we'll have all that stuff uh, open and you'd be able to buy a combo package so you can actually see the conf and get the workshop. Yeah, it's going to be a full day workshop and we're going to start. There's no assumptions that folks know anything about testing. So all you need for that workshop is to be familiar with React Native and building basic React Native apps. We're going to come in, we're going to learn um, just from the start of like what even is an assertion and what are tests and test suites, building up to component tests and end-to-end -end tests, and really give folks a great kickstart. So I think that's a great option if folks want to have a really concentrated day to get some momentum going for them. Okay, great. I think uh, we'll go ahead and get to the picks. Um, Spencer, do you have any picks today? Yeah, so uh, one of my picks, I guess, is kind of a self-promotion as well and kind of goes along with this. Uh, but on reactnativeschool.com, I just finished up a class on kind of building a component library, utilizing Storybook, which has kind of been my method of testing, just kind of like being really, really intentional with how I'm designing components. So that's been a, it's been nice, if not anything else, just putting together a uh, process. And yes, I do use story shots in there. That's kind of like that, that bonus of, you know, I, I wrote these tests. I, I like to look at Storybook as uh, like documentation for my components as well. And then on top of that, like, Using story shots, you get tests out of those for free. So that's been cool. Um, and then one other thing that I would highly encourage people to consider is just to, for the last month since the beginning of the year, I've basically not used Twitter at all. Um, and it's been nice just not dealing with any noise. So if, if Twitter ever frustrates you, just kind of like delete the app, sign out of it everywhere. It's, it's, uh, it's a good feeling. All right. Um, so, Gant, do you have any picks? Yeah. First off, I want to say if you're uh, really sad that you can't talk to Spencer on Twitter, go ahead and follow me instead. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've been uh, I've been on the other side of that spectrum. I've been really working on uh, making a Twitter presence. Um, I raced Jamin Holmgren to 3K, uh, 3K followers, which to some of you <clears throat> natter. Uh, that's nothing, <laughs> but it was uh, sort of like me awakening in the social perspective and, and starting to realize I'm getting to be that old guy. So I need to kind of work on it. And what happened is um, he beat the hell out of me, by the way. Jamin beat the hell out of me, but I'm still trying to catch up and pass him up. So one of the things I've done is I've really kind of amped up the game on this. Um, so... <laughs> It's really nice that I think about like completely removing the app, but also at the same time, I've also I've got enough momentum now that I can't uh, I've bought in. So the, the other what my picks are besides besides stealing <laughs> Spencer's Twitter, Twitter speed air is um, uh, one, of course, chain react. Uh, please, please, please just check it out. Watch the videos, see the experience. We, we care deeply about making that happen. And I hope that everybody's going to be there. We'll even do a discount code for people on the show. So, uh, Nader, I'll, I'll create one for everybody who listens to the podcast. Um, and then secondly, uh, I just sort of a weird thing. While we're kind of sitting here, I can uh, hear loud keyboards and different things that kind of happen. And I remember how people used to say that about me. And I installed this thing called crisp.ai. That's K-R-I-S-P dot A-I. And I can clap, I can punch things, there can be a loud train behind me. And for some reason, this thing's so smart on podcasts and plenty of other things, it can pick out and remove that sound out of my live interaction. So if you're a remote worker or you do meetings like this, um, I'm just constantly reminded how amazing this is. And I would tell it, it's free beta right now. Um, and it's just like the neatest thing for me to show people. Like I start clapping in video and people can't hear the clapping. The one thing it can't seem to do is like uh, disqualify my dogs. They know how to get around AI somehow. I don't know. So I'm looking forward to updates on that. Nice. Uh, Josh, do you have any uh, picks today? Sure. I would definitely 
uh, back up the recommendation for Chain React. I attended last year and it was really great. So even if you no interest in testing, like don't have to come to my workshop, like attend the conference <laughs> for sure. I went to about three conferences last year and Chain React honestly was the, the most fun I had. It was really well put together. The size felt like just right. Um, it was big enough and real, I mean, really influential React Native community speakers but at the same time, small enough that, and as, as a single track conference, you were seeing all the same stuff that everybody was. You could have a great conversation with anybody in the halls. So definitely, definitely check out Chain React. Uh, other picks, um, for about six months, I've been using an app called Bear on Mac OS and iOS uh, to take notes, and it's been really fun. Um, I'm kind of a note-taking nerd, so I've switched around apps a few different times. Even my one side project that's, that I've made a couple hundred bucks on was a note-taking app, but I've switched to this one. I've, I've jumped ship off my own ship. Um, one of the things that's really cool about it is um, I was I, I do a lot, when I do blog uh, writing I'll do it I'll write on my phone and then write on my Mac and um, I was using an app that was using Dropbox to synchronize stuff but it would have conflicts a lot because it's you know it wasn't mainly made for real time synchronization but Bear Notes um, it can still sometimes get a conflict but it's very very fast and the synchronization is built right into the app so I much less frequently have uh, any kind of sync conflicts. I just have the content that I'm working on wherever I want it. So whether it's like writing for a blog or just my personal journal and random notes in meetings and stuff like that, uh, Bear Notes uh, really covers all that. So it's really great. The last pick I have is called Dependabot. So I learned about this from the Ember.js community because they were using it, but it works in Ruby, JavaScript, all kinds of other languages. It's a bot that you hook up to GitHub and it will automatically check for when your dependencies for your project are updated. So talk about like avoiding security issues and things like that. Um, Dependabot overnight will just send in pull requests for each dependency. And if you've got good test coverage, um, that's another thing about testing is like when you have test coverage of some kind, even if it's just a few end-to-end -end tests, you can have much more confidence for updating these dependencies. This is what actually prompted me to put that end-to-end -end coverage for my side project. So it'll just send in a, a, uh, a pull request for each dependency as it updates. You can see that the test pass, um, and you can merge it in if so. And if you've ever run into the situation where you know something you work on infrequently, and it's like two years later, and it's like, oh, wow, that version of Ruby is end of life, and it's not getting security updates anymore, and now I have to update a bunch of things at once, um, this makes it a lot simpler and it, it's, it's a little bit gamified, honestly. Like I wake up in the morning and it's like, oh, cool. Let's see what uh, PRs I have. Now I can feel good about keeping my app up to date. So maybe I'm the only one weird one that gets this endorphin rush from like merging a PR uh, to update a dependency, but it's a lot of fun. So yeah, um, but yeah, certainly for uh, commercial projects, I mean, I'm going to be pulling that in for all my work just to keep the latest and greatest and uh, make sure I don't fall behind the, the update curve. Uh, so Dependabot, uh, Dependabot, highly recommend. That's all for me. Very cool. Um, we have such a good pick so far. <laughs> and I have three picks today, so I'm going to continue to add to that, hopefully. Um, my first pick was the React Native Amazon conference that me and Gant just finished last week, actually. Um, it was the first conference that I've attended internally, and we actually had attendance from um, a lot of the people from the Facebook React Native team, as well as uh, we had Bugsnag come externally and Gantt from Infinite Red. And it was really interesting to hang out with the guys from React Native uh, core team because I haven't uh, done that in a while. And to actually spend a few days with them and kind of uh, talk to them and see the momentum that, 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 uh, that they have right now and, and some of the future plans. And it's, uh, it's, it's, I don't think it's ever been a better time than to be a React Native developer than today. Um, I think we'll have some really interesting stuff that you're going to see happen over the next year. Um, I'm really excited about some of the people that they've also picked up. Sebastian McKenzie joined the team last week, um, a few other people over the last few months. So it's it's really uh, it's really a good time to be a React Native developer. I just wanted to kind of like uh, thank them for coming out. Um, my other pick, uh, my second pick, is Gant's intro talk to his talk <laughs> at the conference. It was probably like his talk was probably the best talk I've ever seen in my life, and I've been to quite a few conferences. <laughs> But the intro was uh, was kind of what put it over the top. And um, Gant, do you know where they can find that? I know I tweeted out a couple of things about it, but it's, it's on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, I've got the YouTube link. I'll I'll be sure to send it out. Um, it, that was that was the brainchild of working with uh, Frank von Hoven, the React Native newsletter editor. Um, kind of chatting with him and talking about how to make. Um, how, how to make like people really kind of interested in the crazy world of AI stuff. And so we brought a deep fake 
<laughs> for the intro and, and a fantastic Nicolas Cage impersonation. Um, and believe it or not, that was the most fun that entire weekend, just shooting all the video necessary for that intro. It was, it was a lot. Of, I'm glad that it killed so, so much. It was, if, if, if only I enjoyed it, I would have been OK with it. But the fact that people are also enjoying it makes me super happy <laughs> and less weird. So, <laughs> yeah, we should definitely put that in the show notes. That's a, that was a lot of that was a that was a fun weekend project. Cool. Yeah, I'll definitely link to it. And then my last uh, pick is app.js comp. So if you're in Europe or in, you're in Eastern Europe and you're looking for a React Native conference to come to and you can't uh, make it over to Chain React, in Poland in April, there's actually a, an expo and React Native conference that looks like it's going to be really awesome. I'm going to be there putting on a workshop, but from talking to the people that are putting it on um, at Software Mansion, I'm really excited about it. I'm going to be giving a talk there on building GraphQL apps with React Native full stack apps. There's a bunch of other really good workshops there, and then there's one day of conference. So the tickets are on sale there, and I'll, I'll put a link to that as well. And I think that wraps it up. Um, Josh, this is the first time you've been on the show, but it's been one of my favorite episodes. So thanks for coming on. Yeah, thanks so much to all you guys. I've learned a lot from all three of you as I've started to get into React Native. And so it's cool to find a little niche that I can contribute to. Um, and so, yeah, I would definitely repeat that encouragement to other folks that are getting started in React Native. Like, come help us out. Like, help us grow as a community. So thanks for having me on. Awesome. Well, thanks, everyone, for listening. That wraps it up. And we'll see you all next time.